I looked out the window, and there I saw this massive wall of flame. Holy shit. This is crazy. We were fighting the beast. It was a living, breathing, eating machine. We had 860,000 liters of fuel. Where are you? Right now, I'm escorting fuel through a burning hell. I'm getting phone calls from parents. Where are you? Do you have my child? It's monstrous. It does whatever it wants to do. It will eat anything in its path. Holy <laughs> Look at that! Oh, my God! It's going to burn you! As temperatures rise all around the globe, natural disasters are becoming more violent and more frequent. Extreme weather survivors have captured the intensity and the magnitude of these events. These are first-hand accounts of a planet gone rogue. One of the worst natural disasters in Canadian history struck on May 3rd, 2016, when a wildfire ripped through the city of Fort McMurray, Alberta. The fire became known as the Beast and forced 88,000 people out of their homes, scrambling for their lives. Might have been the last time I ever saw my house right there. Holy Fire Chief Darby Allen led the city's efforts to battle the blaze. At times, it was five or 600 feet in the air, taking up all your eyesight. So as far as you could see left and right and in the air, it was flame. And for those people that were on the ground fighting that fire, overwhelming. Just down the road from where I live. On Monday morning, Fort McMurray resident Jason Louvel films the season's first fires from his rooftop. It's fire number two. And there's fire number one. A few water bombers in there now. That's a bad one over there, folks. We could see the smoke, so that's why we went in and see what was happening. You okay back there, puppy? Hey, say hi. Yeah. Well, there's off-road trails throughout. You can just take the trails, and they do end up leading to where the fires were. Well, there it is. Another big forest fire for Fort Mac. The wildfire west of Fort McMurray grew overnight, but it has been kept in check and away from town by overnight dozer work and ground firefighting efforts. Super dry. It's 30 degrees again today. Wind changes direction. It's going to come into town and we're going to have to evacuate. You know, I'm informed it was the driest conditions for 50 years. We'd had consistent high temperatures, no humidity, it's prime for any type of ignition source for that forest uh, in some way or another to get going. Fort McMurray is surrounded by the northern boreal forest, which spans from Alaska to Newfoundland. And the heart of Canada's oil production sits 100 kilometers north of the city. It's the Athabasca oil sands, where over 1 million barrels of heavy crude oil are pumped out of the ground every day. So when the first fires start just a few kilometers from the city, water bombers and helicopters are quickly dispatched by Alberta Forestry. I don't think they want us here anymore. They're blocking the road. Uh, I think we just got in trouble for coming and watching the fire. The helicopter's landing. Yep. Jason and his friends are told to clear the road so ground crews can pave the way for an air attack. This early on, a lot hinges on how fast and how hard these units can strike. There they go. Sweet! Well, the lady said they're going to be bombing here very shortly. They should be getting out of here. I'm concerned. I know how dry it is. We also know how quick this thing is moving. And I'm concerned, although the reports are it's going to pass us by, the wind is continually changing. So although the wind is currently taking it down and away, if that wind changes, we're in trouble. 6.30 at night, on my way to night shift. There's a huge plume of smoke coming up just over the hill. Ash everywhere on the ground. 
Chris Burroughs and Gina Bourdois have lived here for a decade. They've seen their share of wildfires, but this one is different. So in a sense, we were sort of jaded because yeah, we, we've been living in a forest fire area and a forest fire zone, but it never got that close. Hope we make it through tonight. A little more fire starting. So at the end of the day on the second, we were in a comfortable position enough. There was no imminent threat at that time. But although we were hopeful, I was concerned that we were going to have some trouble on the third. When dusk comes, firefighting crews are pulled back to safety. And Dale Benfeld gets ready for a long night. And that's what I did all Monday night, was monitor the situation with the staff that I had in the regional operations center. And really, that's the calm before the storm. At night, with the way the ground is out there, there's a number of valleys, there's a number of gullies. It can go in any direction, but you don't know where it is because you don't have a visual on it. Anything could happen. The following morning, residents wake up to a crisp blue sky and everything seems to be under control. It's a beautiful day. There's very little smoke in the air. People are phoning me, we're fine, everything's wonderful. I remember giving a press conference that morning saying, you know what, Let, let's not really count our chickens. That, that fire's sitting there and it, it's, it's just resting up and it, it's gonna come back. People think it's fine and it's all gone away and uh, it's nice to have that thought, but I just want people to bear in mind and don't get into a full cell security. Uh, we're in for a rough day. What Chief Allen fears is an inversion. At night, the cool air keeps the lid on the fire and smoke below. So even though a fire might still be going, no smoke can be seen. But as the morning sun heats up the atmosphere, the cold air mass lifts and the fire emerges. Oh dear. It's getting bad again. All the fires have worked on all restarted. Fluid situation in downtown Fort McMurray. The winds have shifted, so we have some announcements. This is a 30-minute alert to potential evacuation. Be ready, have your bag packed, be ready to leave when the announcement comes. Boy. The winds pick up and push the fire towards the southern edge of the city in the direction of the Abbasand, Grayling Terrace, and Beacon Hill neighborhoods. So we're, we're live here in Fort McMurray in the community of Beacon Hill. This is one community under voluntary evacuation. And I'll tell you, basically noon came and it went from kind of smoky and then in, in a matter of 20 minutes or so, you know, it just went black. There's no more waiting around. We are evacuated. We wrote out a very quick evacuation order. No, it went. Mandatory evacuation update, okay? Residents of Avisand, Grayling Terrace, Beacon Hill are now under a mandatory evacuation order. Mandatory evac. You want us out of here. People are panicking, there's accidents everywhere. It doesn't seem like we're gonna be getting out of here. It was just me and my missus here and the animals, so we just picked up what we could here and tried to get out of town. Gina is at work when she hears the evacuation order. I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like, Chris is at home right now. I need, I need to call him. Called him, called him, no answer. Of course, he's sleeping because he has to work that night. I was sound asleep. I had earplugs in from working the night before. I ended up calling my neighbor. And my neighbor said, OK, I'll, I'm not home right now, but I'll get my boyfriend to go knock on the door. And as I woke up, I could feel the house shaking because of the slamming going on in the door. And I looked out the window, and there I saw this massive wall of flame. With minutes to spare, Chris gets out of his house and jumps into his neighbor's truck. There was cars everywhere, so Somebody had actually backed their truck up, smashed the gate going into a running trail into the forest. And we went through the woods down a running trail instead of getting stuck on the street. 
As news of the evacuation sweeps through the city's neighborhoods, gridlock brings traffic to a standstill. Here's old Abyssin, it's gonna burn down. She's, uh, she's pretty bad, boys. Burning up pretty good. The cops gotta get direct in traffic and get people moving out of here. We're all sitting ducks if this starts breaching the property line. Fort McMurray is in the middle of the Borealis Forest. There's one way in and there's one way out. But can the roads take the people? And the rationale was, no, the roads can't take the people. On May 3rd, 2016, a seasonal wildfire unexpectedly burns out of control. Hasty exit. Might have been the last time I ever saw my house right there. Holy it threatens the Canadian oil sands boomtown of Fort McMurray, Alberta. Mandatory evacuation order. You gotta stay calm. Lord, keep us safe. Get us out of Fort McMurray in one piece. Look at that. Oh my God. Whoa. Yeah, I can feel. Holy crap. The window was hot. Fort McMurray is home to 88,000 residents. And if they can make it out of their neighborhoods to reach the only highway in town, they might have a chance to survive. <laughs> By now, there are areas of the city that are completely engulfed in fire. It's monstrous. It does whatever it wants to do. It will eat anything in its path. The beast does not let up. In a terrifying display of its unstoppable power, it jumps across the Athabasca River. It jumped 1,200 feet. That was astounding to us, because we had been told time again that the river was enough of a buffer that it wouldn't cross it. When it reaches something it wants to go across, but naturally it's stopping it, it tends to bend over the top. So that fire load and that wind is forcing it over the top. So those embers fly over now, and they start touching down on the other side. You know, in a typical fire, you're talking about little pieces of embers. Here, we're talking about whole pieces of trees and flying large debris that's on fire that's now falling on the other side of the river. It is chaos, really. You hear the emergency sirens going, but I need to show you, it, it's not just on the border. This is Fort McMurray burning. I got a dodge. I can feel the heat here. Holy this is insane. Holy. Oh, you can feel the heat. Not in. Holy. This is crazy. Yeah, we're just stuck on the hill here. I think you may want to consider shutting down 63 or not. You'll get any of those cars that I have in You have to shut it down or come to you. This is Highway 63. The fire seems to be burning across the highway. So people who are trying to go southbound on Highway 63 here to get away from all of this now are likely having to turn around. Holy f look at that! Roll your window up. Turn over that lane. Holy f I felt I needed to go on the ground to get a sense of what was going on, uh, to feel the situation. When I get to Abbasan, I'm watching the side of the hill burn. There's a, a light up of vehicles going up the hill. So each vehicle I assessed was about three meters long. Given that, I think about 10,000 vehicles have to leave this city. I don't have enough space. And this is where I'm talking with Darby. I say, we've got to move people north and south. The decision was made that if you lived south of Taganova, you will go south. If you live north of Taganova, you will go north. So we changed the southbound lanes to all be northbound so that the traffic could get out of town. Our most effective tool, hands down, turned out to be Twitter. You know, there was no fluff language in anything. It was, this community is under mandatory evacuation. This is where you need to go. But you're talking tens of thousands of people getting to see that message really quickly based on how fast it was being shared. Chris and Gina reunite in a downtown parking lot. Gave him a big hug, <laughs> big kiss. Yeah, we held each other for a long time. Yeah. I don't know. It was nice to get everyone together finally, but you know, what do we do? Where do we go? 
Rock 97, I'm sorry to interrupt the uh, the Guns N' Roses, but here's what we've heard so far from multiple, multiple people. Southbound 63, okay. according to reports, is opened up. Somebody drove by and hollered out their window. The southbound highway is open. It's open. So we all kind of looked at each other and thought, let's get out of here. Let's make our way towards Edmonton. We just left Walmart, but everything, like you remember that hill where we go up? Everything, all that side of the hill is on fire. The other side on the highway, everything is on fire, flames. We're leaving now. It is absolutely crazy. Okay, honey, just drive. Get past all this. I don't want to be in the smoke. I don't. I want to go. Gee, I'm going. Just relax. We're doing everything we can. I know. But we're driving into it, and like, I wish I had a mask. Look at this, G. Oh my God. And as we were leaving the city. We drove right into a tremendous wall of smoke and, and fire. It was on both sides of the highway. There's not enough firefighters for all this. Oh my God, if there was, we wouldn't have this. Look at the cars. People parked in the ditch. They just left their cars and got out. What's going on? Uh, Look at this. Look at all these cars. Vehicles would stall when they started taking up the smoke, they would, they would get no combustion in their engine, so they were left stuck there. Oh my god, Chris, look at the other side. Oh my god. This is just horrific. It was out of a zombie apocalypse movie. Look at this bus. Oh my god. Oh my god, Denny's. Look at this. Oh my god. The whole hotel oh is gone. Oh my god. Oh my god. Look at this whole, the whole trailer park is gone. Ah. Uh, One day, and it just ripped through the whole city. One day, so many people's homes are gone. This is, we're finally leaving. City limits. The fire does not let up. And now that the beast has jumped over the Athabasca, it's making its way north of the city. So now it's got a clear path up towards the majority of our population, 40 or 50,000 residents in the Thickwood and Timberley area. On May 3rd, 2016, a raging wildfire bursts into the city of Fort McMurray, Alberta. Holy f look at that! Holy f Oh my God. The whole hotel oh is gone. All of the lanes south of town are dedicated to south traffic. Three neighborhoods in the southern part of the town are being evacuated, and the situation worsens when the fire heads north. Mandatory evacuation for everyone, everywhere. There's the official word we were waiting for. So now we're faced with a fire coming into town that's approximately four or five kilometers wide, and it's about 20 kilometers long. We sent approximately 25,000 people north, and we didn't know where we were sending them. We just knew we had to get them out of town at that time. To the north of the city are the oil sands production facilities, but also the camps that house the workers employed by the energy industry. A lot of these camps can hold up to a couple thousand workers at a time. They're very large, so I knew there's a safe spot 20 kilometers away. And I started telling everybody, get the message out, everybody goes to the Rauta Lodge. From there, we could get people farmed up to all the other camps north of here. At the Father Turcotte wow. Elementary School in downtown Fort McMurray, a few students are still waiting for their moms and dads. But Principal Lisa Hilsentegger decides it's too dangerous to wait any longer. There didn't seem to be any more parents showing up at this time. So I did an all call in the school. We're leaving, please come to the front. Students got on the bus, I got on, closed the door. There was no doubt in my mind that that was my responsibility to uh, see it to the end, to get all the students home. Just to repeat for you, a mandatory evacuation for the entire city of Fort McMurray is now in effect. At this point, we were being told to go north. And uh, it was very slow. It was very hot on the bus. And it was very, it was dark, but it was very orange. Residents go to Noralta Lodge, which is 21 kilometers north of Fort McMurray. 
Miguel and Pam Borges are also heading north with their three children. Originally, we were heading north, and that's what uh, the emergency broadcast kept telling us. The highway south is closed. Fires cross the highway. You can't go south. And then we're heading down Thickwood Boulevard, and then the police are directing us to go south. So we went south. We were in separate cars, and yeah. I thought, oh, please, do not send him south and me north, because, yeah. like, there's just no way. I, I wouldn't <laughs> be able to do it. I think I would just disobey and say, nope, it's sorry, fine. I'm leaving. 63 South, visibility is poor. There's fire right along the side of the highway. But we've had a couple people tell us you can get through, but drive with extreme caution. There are lots of people pulled over on the side of the road. So we, we hit the highway, all of a sudden traffic's moving, and then we get up to the bridges to head downtown and smoke everywhere. And you can't see any of the buildings. And then we see up on Abbasan, the fire's right at the it's highway. It's just fire, right, fire at right at the highway. And then finally we hit the top of Beacon Hill and we see the hotel on fire and the gas station and everything else is on fire there. We're just gonna keep driving. The message is to get out. I think people are realizing this now. If they were staying behind, uh, you know, it's just too risky. And when you drive by this, you know why you have to get out. While the highway fills up with traffic, firefighters save the homes people have left behind. You know, I had 32 guys on duty that day. 65 guys came in in their own time and fought that fire. We had approximately 100 firefighters from industry that came into town to help us. You're dumping right at us. Mel Engelstad was part of that group of first responders. Oh, here she comes. She's coming through the bushes. My question is, how wide is this sucker? We are taking communities and saying, we can protect this community, we can save this community, but this one is already so far gone, we need to redeploy and move. There were various areas in the city where it was literally, if we didn't pull those guys out, they wouldn't have survived. For one firefighter, the fight became very personal. We had uh, been sent up to assist a pump crew that was up in Abbasand. We're driving down my block, and I noticed that I'm looking at my house, it's on fire. It's the first one on the block, and it's fully engulfed in flames. I said, oh, shit, all right, there it goes. Trampoline was on fire. You know, my kids played daily on that trampoline. Uh, I, I watched my 69 Firebird in the garage come up in flames. Firebird was on fire. <laughs> at that moment, my captain got out of the truck to come stand beside me. He put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, do you need a moment? And I said, no, there's nothing we can do here. It's all stuffed and it's all gone. So let's go make a stand somewhere else. Miguel and Pam have made it out of town. But now they're stuck in traffic and the next gas station is 200 kilometers away. So this is when a real panic started setting in because Pam's van was going to run out of gas. Miguel and Pam aren't the only motorists running out of gas. But when stranded evacuees ask for help on social media, a private group of truck enthusiasts comes to the rescue. They knew as soon as they were evacuating town that a lot of people wouldn't make it. So we left Edmonton in a group of three, and we just started kind of putting out messages um, to whoever else that was coming. We just stopped at one of the card locks on the way. I swiped my card out of my own account, filled up whatever we could hold, and away we went north. Every time that we'd saw someone on the side of the roads, we'd pull a U-turn. We'd say, hey, do you need anything? You know, we have fuel on, we have snacks for the kids, we've got some dog food, cat food. Anyone who needed help, company truck, personal truck, if you needed help, we were there. By the time Miguel and Pam Borges reach a service station that still has some gas to sell, they're running on fumes. So we get in the line for gas there, uh, and maybe a thousand cars, literally a thousand cars in front of us. And during the line, a woman approached us and, and said, hey, you got kids, you look tired, do you need a place to stay? If so, they're about to open a camp. They're about to open, it's not open yet, uh, about a kilometer in, in, uh, down the road. Um, she said, yeah, sure, we have no plans, you know. 
We've been driving all day. The Borges family finally arrives at the Wandering River Camp, an oil industry facility. So they have a lady at the desk. You give them your license plate number, and it's like, OK, go get something to eat. So it was like the best chicken fingers ever, because we were really hungry. Back up north, Principal Lisa is still on the school bus with her precious cargo. Now I'm getting phone calls from parents. Where are you? Do you have my child? They're frantic. And uh, I remained as calm as I could. We have them. They're safe. They're good. This is where we're at. We'll find you. Where are you? It takes them five hours to reach an oil camp. There, Lisa reunites more students with their parents. But when she learns that the route south is open again, she rounds up the few kids still in her charge and decides to take the chance. It was black. You could just barely see the lines on the road. When we got closer to the city, we saw the hotel along Highway 63 had burned. So we knew that Beacon Hill was, was gone. Once we got to uh, the south end of the city, we knew we were going to be OK. Lisa takes the last kids to her dad's place, where they stayed for a few days until they were reunited with their parents. And finally, at this point, I thought, I did my job. As his firefighters work into the night, battling multiple fires spreading throughout the city, Chief Darby delivers a sobering update. It, it's in the city. It is impacting communities as we speak, and homes are on fire as we speak. It's a sad day for, for everyone in McMurray. We've had a, a devastating day. May 3rd, 2016 delivered a devastating blow to the city of Fort McMurray when a ferocious wildfire swept into the oil sands boomtown and forced 88,000 people to flee for their lives. We successfully evacuated. Eighty-eight thousand people. No one is hurt, and no one has passed away right now. I really hope that we get to the end of this and we can still say that. When we first light came on the 4th, we managed to get some reconnaissance and see what had happened. And I felt a weight lift off to my shoulder once we realized that the people were out, because that creates a different dynamic. Now we're fighting structure fire. The fire they nicknamed the beast is still raging, and it's getting bigger. It was everywhere. We used the term the beast. I call it a three-headed monster because it was going east, then it went north, it went south. Uh, it was constantly changing. We had literally walls of flames. At times, there was walls of flames like that, you know, 100 feet tall on three sides of us. This thing was a living thing. No matter what you were doing, it was going to do something else. We were fighting the beast. I mean, it was a fight. You go and you go and you go until there's no more give. It was moving sometimes, you know, three meters per minute, then 12 meters per minute, and then we we're hearing 102 meters per minute. It seemed to have a mind of its own. It, it, it did whatever it wanted, it went where it wanted. It was a living, breathing, eating machine. It was hungry. The beast was hungry, and, and we had to try and get ahead of it. As the beast grows in size and power, it creates its own weather system. As intense heat from the ground rises up, the smoke carries water vapor and ash and forms into a pyrocumulus cloud. As the hot air moves up, cooler air rushing in to replace it produces severe gusts of wind inside the inferno, which in turn fuels the fire. By now, firefighters from other parts of the province have joined Darby's troops to help save homes and critical infrastructure. 
but they're running on empty. A couple of our members are actually volunteer firefighters. One of them messaged us and said, you need to get here as quick as you can because a lot of the fire trucks are running out of fuel. We have nothing. We drove up the highway from the police roadblock and we literally drove through three or four sections of fire on either side of the road. Pitch dark, smoke so thick that you could barely see the vehicle in front of you. We need light plants and generators. Where are you? Oh, well, right now I'm escorting fuel through a burning hell. Up 63. We had 860,000 liters of fuel. We thought if anyone looked at this from the outside, they'd think we're crazy. We're literally driving a vehicle loaded with a bomb through an inferno. They couldn't really believe that. We we're just a regular bunch of guys that figured that someone would need help and we just kind of showed up. Back near the Athabasca River, the fire is still raging and is fast approaching one of the city's most critical pieces of infrastructure. This water treatment plant is what feeds all the hydrants that's being used in the firefight. As a firefighter, the worst thing you feel is when you don't feel that pressure in that hose line and that water's not coming in the end. As the fire advances towards the plant, a skeleton crew of engineers man the pumps to keep the water flowing. You could stand in this control room here and look out to the fire, and you could watch the flame start up when a wind gust came through and go back down. Like, the fire was everywhere. Those guys were still in the water treatment plan, keeping that water going with fire totally around. The firefighters are doing their part to help fight the fire on the front line. We need to provide them with water. If we had lost our water treatment plant, we would have lost our city. In the following days, strong gusts of wind fanned the fires. Now it's heading towards those oil sands plants where we've got all those people. I had to evacuate north to one of the, the camps up north. And one of the big fears up in the northern camps was, well, what if the fire went north? Uh, and continued going north and blocked off the highway. We would essentially all be stranded up there, and by day two, that was becoming a, a real sense of worry. So we brought them out in convoys. RCMP vehicle in the front. I believe there was 30 or 40 vehicles at a time in that convoy. The energy companies also charter additional planes to fly evacuees and their pets to Edmonton and Calgary. Once you started hearing about the flight starting to go out, I think there was a little bit more calmness in those camps uh, from the evacuees because they knew that they were going to get to safety sooner rather than later. In all, about 25,000 people were evacuated from the northern camps. And as they fled, hundreds of firefighters flew in from all over Canada to assist in driving out the beast. By May 12th, through the persistence and bravery of many, the fire was finally chased out of Fort McMurray. Hey, everybody. Just want to let you know we, th we think we got this thing beat in McMurray. So I just want to let you know, like, we, we just can't let you back until it's safe. We've got to check the electricity, water, all that stuff. So we'll get you back as soon as we can, we promise. Be patient, look after yourselves, take care. Now the question on everyone's mind is how much damage did the city suffer? and whose homes are still standing. For a whole week and all around the clock, hundreds of firefighters battle the terrifying blaze that engulfs Fort McMurray, Alberta. On May 13, 2016, Chief Darby Allen confirms that within city limits, the fire is under control. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. But that doesn't mean 88,000 evacuees can now return home. I know that everyone is anxious to return home. We're anxious for you to return home. But there is some work to be done to make sure it's safe for everyone before that can happen. Chief Darby takes Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau 
and Alberta Premier Rachel Notley on a tour for a first-hand look at the destruction. Entire neighborhoods have been destroyed. In total, about 2,700 homes have burned to the ground and many more have sustained severe damage. But this tally only accounts for bricks and mortar. It does not include the deep emotional distress that now affects the entire community. For many years, Fort McMurray contributed huge amounts to the growth of our economy. Uh, now this community needs help, and I can guarantee you, Canada will be here for this community. It will be weeks before the city is ready for residents to return. But it could have been a lot worse. In those early days, we knew that we had managed to save a good chunk of the properties. and. You know, it turned out that we saved around 85, 84% of the properties. The city was surrounded by an ocean of fire, but Fort McMurray and the surrounding communities have been saved and they will be rebuilt. But getting the city ready to take back 88,000 residents is easier said than done. It's really easy to turn the switch off, but to start it on again is a whole lot more work. You've got to get banks back online. You've got gas stations back online. And the big part about that, too, is that when you evacuate everybody, that means all your workers are gone, too. While the city of Fort McMurray prepares to rise from the ashes, the beast still roams the forest. Even though it's outside the city, it was still burning out there. It headed across into Saskatchewan. It would take another month and the help of Mother Nature to bring the fire under control. By then, it had spread across more than 589,000 hectares of wilderness. A very large area, but for experts, it comes with the territory. In Canada, on average, we have about 7,000 forest fires, and it burns about 2 million hectares, which is about half the size of Nova Scotia. Fires are part of the natural cycle of the boreal forest. Fire reduces the spread of disease and resets the clock for new generations of trees. We have fire on the landscape. Wherever we have vegetation, we can have fire. Unfortunately, sometimes communities get in the way of the path of a fire, as in the case in Fort McMurray, and then you have disastrous results. Now, the fire is still under investigation. We're not sure exactly what caused it. it may have been a four-wheeled vehicle uh, from a spark hitting a rock, or sometimes material gets caught up on the muffler, and it heats up and starts to smolder, and then the wind comes along, and we're off to the races. Whatever made the spark, it was a human who caused the fire. But it will take years of study before the increasing risk and severity of wildfires in the Canadian boreal forest can be fully understood. Fire in Canada has doubled since the 70s, and we believe this is due to human-caused climate change. Three reasons. Fire seasons are longer. The official fire season in Alberta now starts March 1st. It used to be April 1st. Second, the warmer it gets, the more lightning we get. The more lightning we get, everything else being equal, the more fires we get. Third reason, as the atmosphere warms, fuels will be drier, easier for fires to start and spread. So we expect more intense fires in the future. The re-entry date is set for June 1st. As thousands prepare to return, the city tries to help soften the shock. When you leave and all you see is a burning wall of fire, you know, you're gonna think the worst. And so we had a, we, it was our job to make sure that there was, you know, there was hope. The communication team sets up a website that posts aerial before and after photographs of every single residential and commercial property in Fort McMurray. We had to preface that with the knowledge that this may be the way that you find out that you've lost your home. And that there was, when you first got to this website, that message did come up. We understand that it was going to be a very challenging and emotionally hard experience for, for a lot of folks. And 
uh, that, that lost their homes. And you know, this isn't just a, a house that you lose, it's, it's a lifetime of memories in a lot of cases. Many months would pass before all the financial costs would be known. Calculating the emotional toll of the fires on families and marriages will be more difficult to assess for those who decide to leave and start a new life elsewhere, and those who choose to stay, to rebuild and to resume their lives in the town they call home. By June 1st, 88,000 Fort McMurray residents begin returning to their communities. And a welcoming committee is awaiting them. We drove in, and just as we're up to the bridge, Carmen wakes up, and she sees the firefighters. And she said, are we home? Are we home? And um, she was super excited. She started to cry. And then, of course, I started to cry. Our chief. Darby Allen organized two trucks to stay on top of the bridge coming into town. We had a huge 50-foot Canadian flag flapping in the air and uh, two crews of firefighters standing on the bridge waving at everyone coming and throwing us. You know, there was a lot of honking horns and, and tears. And uh, for, for my guys that were on that bridge, it, it meant a lot for them too. We were the last people they see when they left the town. So for them to see us come back into town, standing there waving at them, I think that hit a lot of hearts in, in, a, in a great way. But for many returning residents, the firefighters' warm welcome was followed by a devastating and heartbreaking sight. Entire neighborhoods destroyed by the wildfires. I knew that the house wasn't going to survive, but there's always that hope. You know, you hope that you have a home to come home to. All that remains of Chris Burrow's house is an empty lot filled with ashes and debris. There was a few things that we, we managed to pull out of the remains. Uh, this is what's left of my grandfather's watch from uh, after the war. This was what uh, my mom kept and would put our family's uh, baby teeth in. <laughs> so other than that, everything perished in a fire and it was uh, tragic. Whoa, it jumped the road from over here. As Jason Louvell and his girlfriend drive into their neighborhood, it appears that most of the homes have been destroyed. Uh, what you're looking at is supposed to be all houses. All these houses look, those houses, perfectly fine, eh? They just sprayed over so it wouldn't burn. But near the end of the road, they see that their house has been spared. The house, it was in rough shape. You know, there was ash in the house. We had left a few windows open. And so it was smoked out a bit. But it was phenomenal to come and see the house still here. It's, it's a good feeling. Wrapped in a cocoon. We had to wash all the walls in the house and down in the basement, all the floors had to be scrubbed. Holy <laughs> Had to get the ceilings repainted. At the last step. Looking back on it, it's hard. It fills me up sometimes still talking about it and just thinking about it. Almost back to normal. Hey, puppy. For now, the hardworking people of Fort McMurray remain focused on rebuilding their homes and their communities and making Fort Mac a safer and better place to live. You know, it's an unbelievable town. And I've only worked here for seven years, but this place welcomed me, and I feel a tremendous kinship, ownership with the people here. And I think, if anything, you know, this has maybe let the rest of the country know that uh, it's a pretty good place to be.